Hello everybody, Jake Raby here again, Flat 6 Innovations, coming to you with another RenVision technical video. Now, it's mid-2021, a whole lot of things have changed in life through the pandemic, now we want to say post-pandemic, and things are getting back to normal. We wanted to go through and revise each one of the videos in the bore scoring series to bring in the newest content that we could and make sure all the old content was still in line with what we've been seeing. So in this video, which is diagnosing bore scoring, a lot of things have stayed the same, but things have changed, not really from our perspective or from a bore scoring perspective, but from a user perspective with people who are trying to use this part four video to diagnose their own bore scoring. So I wanted to take this opportunity to revise our content for people to understand exactly the most important things they need to pay attention to and some of the disciplines they've got to have when doing a diagnosis for bore scoring. So the original content for this part four video is basically showing you how to perform your own diagnosis on your own engine using a bore scope. And a lot of people want to try to use all different kinds of things to diagnose bore scoring that are thought to be easier ways to do it. One of those is a compression test. For this bore scoring problem, it is absolutely positively worthless. <laughs> A leak down check is also something that is typically used when you have known cylinder problems or a valve leakage problem. In this case, your leak down test will be absolutely worthless. If you want to do compression and leak down test, then you want to work on a different engine. Neither one of those will show you what you need to know when it comes to diagnosing cylinder bore scoring with the M9X engine. It's not going to happen. So the new addition in this very popular video series, a focus on bore scoring, is going to bring up a lot of new points and is going to drive the point home about some other things that people are trying to use to diagnose these issues other than a visual inspection. We're going to talk specifically about those leak down and compression checks, why they don't work, why they will give you absolutely improper information, and why it doesn't work with this engine design with this particular type of failure because oil in the bores and all that sort of thing. So getting back to the topic at hand, our part four video that you're going to watch following this little bit of a forward, if you will. We bring up the point of using bore scopes like this one found on Amazon for $39.95. So this very simple Bluetooth connected bore scope allows you to use your smartphone to get a good picture of what's inside your cylinders. And it doesn't have all the benefits and extra cameras and angles and all that sort of thing that this professional one does that cost hundreds of dollars, but it does give you actually, in this case, better resolution than this professional grade one. It also is very easy to get and it's cheap and you can use it for all different things, right? I mean, you can use it around the house to look for things in walls and you can check and see if you've got things clogged up and there's all kinds of things. You can inspect your duct work with it. You can look inside the dash of your car, all kinds of things you can do with this little $40 bore scope, okay? But the one thing that you're going to use this for is to see if you have cylinder bore scoring. Now, what a lot of people have done over the years, and we started out doing this, is just taking the bore scope, pulling out the spark plugs, okay, and using the bore scope to look inside the bores 
with each respective piston at bottom dead center. So every time you have to move to a different cylinder, you do take a 24 millimeter wrench, turn the engine over, get the next cylinder you're going to inspect down to bottom dead center, and you are able to inspect that particular cylinder. So on forums, especially on Ren List, I've had a lot of people watch this fourth part in the series, and they've done their own bore scoping. And I don't talk about just going through the spark plug hole. I came up with a method of going through the oil sump, okay? And there's also a different access point that we can use to go into the engine that is something that really we haven't brought up before, even though I did it a few years ago. It takes a little bit more work to get access to it going through another access port here in the front of the engine. We can talk about that one, and we will in another one of the videos, okay? But for now, we're talking about this part four, where we use this cheap little bore scope to go in through the spark plug holes and then also in from the engine oil sump, okay? The engine oil sump gives us a completely different perspective and point of view than going through the spark plugs. From the spark plug angle, we're coming into the cylinder from this side and we're seeing, you know, basically about, I'd say two thirds or so of the picture of the cylinder, but we're not seeing the full picture. The other one third of the picture is actually being covered up by the piston. Because when we're coming in from the top here, and we're coming to the top of this piston, we're only able to see the part of the bore that is not covered up by the piston, which is this entire area and everything below it. This is the most critical portion of the cylinder evaluation. And the reason for that is because that is where bore scoring starts and where bore scoring is most evident. You absolutely must perform your evaluation through the spark plug hole and also through the sump. I'm going to further say, if you're only going to choose one of those points of view, choose the oil sump. You can do the evaluation quicker and better than you can going through the spark plug only. So if you have to choose one of the two, you're going to get a better picture with your piston placed at top dead center and going through the oil sump to get to each one of those particular cylinders and looking at them with the bore scope. Now that doesn't matter which bore scope you use, okay? This bore scope, the, the cheap one, has a camera. You'll see that later in this video. The camera comes out the front and it uses a small mirror, okay? You gotta be very careful when you're working inside the engine with this mirror because it be can become detached and go where you do not want it to go. I've not had any reports of that happening to anybody yet, but I have to bring that up because if it goes in a place where you don't want it to go, you're now tearing your engine down whether or not you had bore scoring because you've got to fetch that part. You can't operate the engine with that part inside of it, okay? The professional one has a little different arrangement here. That monitor kind of comes loose from it on this particular one. And it has a camera that works 90 degrees as well as straight. So you go into the camera settings and you change on the monitor whether you want to see a 90 degree view or a straight view from this. Now, is that worth hundreds of dollars? No, it's not. Actually, I find myself using this little cheap one more than I do the professional one. Even when I'm building an engine now, I've chosen to use this one over the professional one because it has much better resolution. It also takes better pictures and better, better video. When I'm documenting my build for my purchaser, I can show that all those piston pin clips are put in exactly where they belong. Or when I'm doing other instructional videos for my classes, I can get better video with this. This thing's awesome for 40 or 50 bucks, okay? And there's different ones out there. I think somebody recently posted on RenList, they found one of these for like 52 bucks that had a side camera, okay? I'm not sure about that. I haven't looked at it yet, but that's a possibility. So just keep in mind that you want to use a camera that's going to help you do this job. Um, these are not hard to use, but they do require that you set up a little Wi-Fi network. So basically, you know, you'll, you'll go into your settings, you turn this thing on, you find the network that it creates, uh, you, you connect to that network, you put a password in, and then it treats this camera like a small local area network 
via Wi-Fi. That's how it works. You can use it with an iPad, you can use it with an iPhone, you can use it with Android stuff, you can connect it to a computer if it has Bluetooth on it. It's cool for what it does, okay? So that's another point people have had a problem with. I'm technically challenged with some of that sort of stuff. I'm a mechanic, I'm an engine builder, but even I can figure out how to use this one, okay? Um, so let's talk now about the absolute necessity for you to have the discipline and the patience to do your bore scope evaluation through the oil sump. Again, if I had to choose one of these methods of bore scope evaluation, be it going through the spark plug holes, through the cylinder head, and coming in from this angle, or coming in from the sump, I would choose the sump in 100% of the cases. Let's talk about why that is. Well, because it's going to take me longer to remove the spark plugs and coil packs from the engine, especially in a 996 or a 997 where you're fighting cylinder four and you're fighting cylinder one to get to the spark plugs. It's going to take you longer to do that than it is to pull 13 fasteners on your sump plate and remove the sump plate. It's also going to give you a bird's eye view into the heart of your engine. So when you pull that sump plate off, you are going to instantly see a big symptom of bore scoring that you can't see any other way. So as I follow threads on social media and forums, especially RenList, there's been a lot of confusion about how I access cylinder number six, specifically cylinder number six, because it is one that usually has bore scoring. Not to say that any other cylinder can have bore scoring because any cylinder can. You, you can't really look at it that way. In this particular case, we have scoring on cylinders five and cylinder six, okay? Uh, a lot of times you'll have that, or sometimes you'll have it on just five or just six or just four. Sometimes you'll have it on every cylinder, some worse than others. So later on in this particular video that we shot back in 2019, you'll see that we start on bank two and we do our evaluation through the spark plug hole and through the sump looking over here first. The reason for that is because it is mostly prominent here. You can usually down an engine very quickly doing the sump inspection especially if you just move cylinder number six piston up to top dead center, okay, and then access through the sump up into cylinder number six. I want to show you a loose pathway to do that here in just a few minutes because that's a question we get a lot. Up into number six and look at the top and bottom of that particular cylinder using either of these two types of scopes. Of course, that's where having a little mirror on here is going to come in handy, okay, because it's going to show you the top or bottom easier. You can still do it without that, okay. You also might want to introduce some ambient light up through the sump to help illuminate that bore so you don't have to have the camera right on it to illuminate the problematic area, okay? So since we're just revising this video and adding a little bit of stuff for 2021, I'm going to give you a very crude breakdown of the direction that I follow when I do the sump inspection, okay? And this is, you're going to have to get a little creative. The bore scope you have means a lot. This one only has a three and a half millimeter tip on it, which is very, very critical to this. If you look at that compared to this professional one, it's like eight millimeters. It is a tremendous difference, okay? Now, for what this one gains in size, it makes up for features because it has the 90 degree camera. So you, even though you know, you're picking up some size, you have the ability to go 90 degrees. I would actually give up the ability to go 90 degrees to have this very small size. Three and a half millimeter, four millimeter at most is the biggest I would want for this. And the size of this tip means everything. Also, the flexibility of the end of this is important. Some of these can only flex like four inches past the camera. This one only has maybe an inch and a quarter, inch and a half of rigid area before you start to get to your first flexible point. That's another key, okay? Try to pull the sump plate off the night before you're going to do this and let everything drain out, okay? So we bring our camera up into this area. Now this is always open. This area here is open and there is a windage scraper or crankshaft scraper on the bottom of the crankshaft that's black 
and that helps to direct oil back into the sump that's coming off the crankshaft. Okay, you're going to have that to fight with. You also have the crankshaft carrier that actually holds the crankshaft in place and it has a few saddles in there that are in your way. We don't have that here. We can't show it. I'm just trying to give you an example of when you watch later on in this earlier video from 2019 what you're looking at. So you come up in and if I'm trying to get to cylinder six, which is back here, so we are laid out as cylinder six, cylinder five, cylinder four, okay? So this would be the front of the car in a 911 variant, okay? So what I do, if I'm trying to get into cylinder six, I'm gonna fight a little bit, I'm gonna bend this a little bit, kind of like that, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna start fishing it up through that crankshaft carrier I'm going to work around the side of the carrier and the, and the connecting rod here. It's on cylinder five. I'm going to come up and I'm going to try to get this camera about right here in cylinder six. And then you can take a flashlight and bring in some more ambient light kind of down this angle, right? So you, if you bring a flashlight in and get some light up in that cylinder, you're going to, it's going to help you a lot, okay? Because ambient light is a key. If you've got another small little pin light or something that you could get up in there, um, that's going to help you as well because then you don't have to get your camera really any further than about where I'm at right now to see this because your piston is at top dead center. It's up the bore. And then you would clearly be able to look through your camera and see that this, you've got bore scoring. This is so bad you can hear it. Okay, Yours may not be that bad. Okay. If, if it's that bad, you're, you're beyond the point where you even need a bore scope to, to, to make sure you've got scoring. It's going to be very evident with all the other symptoms. Um, but at this point, you can do that. Now, this engine is an M9603, so it has a pass-through point here, and that pass-through point allows the piston pins to be put in along with their clips uh, passing through the crankcase. Now, if it was a little bit later M9603, it would have a windage notch here on each side, and that would be all cut out. You wouldn't have this hole here, okay? You would have a big windage notch. Those are easier to deal with because about a half inch deep, this whole entire portion of the cylinder is removed. So you can go anywhere up inside here and get to your, to your cylinder. Those are the easiest ones. But if yours has holes like this, you want to sneak up in. Now, if you're like that, that's fine. You can also manage it to kind of get it up into cylinder five's pass-through point and work it into cylinder six and do this. That's harder to do because you've got to go up into that bore. This piston's trying to come down and things like that. But that's another angle you can get to. All this comes through the same access point with a good degree of patience, okay? You're going to have to have that. Again, bring in ambient light. If you've got a small pin light, or even if you had a second bore scope that had a light on the end of it, you can use one to provide light, and you can use one to provide the camera view. Um, so that's another good way of, of being able to get up in here. Now, cylinder five is easy. When you go to do cylinder five, you can just kind of come up and pretty much go straight in. You know, seeing the, bo the bottom portion, this side of cylinder five is not as easy. Seeing the top portion of cylinder five is very easy. Cylinder number four is not that hard either. You kind of have to do the same thing you did on six. It's not as difficult, and you have to kind of come up here and go into it. Now, the reason why it's not as difficult is because where this notch is, is further toward cylinder four than it is cylinder six. So it, cylinder four is the easiest one you're going to do, okay? So now I want to show you another little trick about another way you can do this before we go any further. But again, sometimes you have to access the cylinder that you want to see via the cylinder that's adjacent to it. That is the key that not a lot of people are figuring out. I just wanted to show you what I was talking about a little bit more in depth with the windage cutouts that are in the bottom of some of the cylinders in some particular applications. Now Porsche uh, went to these windage notches, then they went back away from it. There's a whole lot of back and forth. We'd have to put a big list out there of each engine designation that has it or doesn't have it. This is an early M9603, so it doesn't have it. Um, some of the later M9603s did have it. This one is extremely early not to have it. Most of them do. So in this case, you see here that we've got just an access port. This is the block that I just showed you guys. 
and I'm showing kind of that access port that I was able to bring the camera up through while we were filming that crude pathway to get into cylinder number six. Over here, this block is an M9721. This would be a Cayman S, okay? And as you can see, this one has Caymanitis. See how the bottom of this blew out? That's because Caymans lose connecting rods really bad and connecting rod bolts, and the connecting rod becomes a bit of a hatchet and it breaks through the block. So that's what you're seeing here. At the end of the day, this notch that you're looking at, this big relief here, makes it a lot easier on the engines that have this, like this M9721, to sneak up into cylinder six, because you've got a big elongated area here, if you will, that will allow you to sneak that bore scope up into number six, okay? So this is a block that has the longer and larger windage notches. This one is not windage relieved at all. It just has the pass-through ports to get the piston pin tool through to load the piston pin and the clip during engine assembly. That's what that's for, okay? So before we get into our previously reviewed content, I just wanted to make sure you guys understand that there is a third way to do this. It's an alternate way to do this. It's one that I've learned years ago, and I just really haven't shared it that much because it requires pulling a couple of things off the engine people don't want to pull off, especially in a mid-engine car. It's a little bit more difficult to get to in the car than it is a rear-engine car. At the same time, people might find that it's actually easier than pulling the sump plate or pulling the spark plugs in some of these applications. So if you're a Renvision member, you'll be able to get that extra alternate method of being able to do this as part of your membership, okay? With that one, we don't go through the spark plug holes and we don't go through the sump. It's an alternate and third method to access this. Of course, if you really want to find out if you've got bore scoring, you can come through the spark plug holes, you can come through the sump, and you can use my alternate method as well. So with no further ado, let's get into our content from 2019. Okay, so here we have a durametric tool, simple tool that you can use in your own garage, and that this data is going to help us to support the diagnostic decisions that we're going to make moving forward. I also want to see if we have any fault codes. Sometimes you'll have fault codes, this one doesn't have any. Um, so a lot of times you'll get a PO300 through PO306. Those are individual or multiple misfires. That tells me that this car is not as far along in the bore scoring process as some others would be. And because of that, we're not picking up the misfires yet. We have some rough running that we can pick up on the rough running index, but it tells me that we're a lower stage of bore scoring at this point. If we do have bore scoring, okay, we've not done the scope yet. We don't know for sure. We're continuing to gather our trend data here to help quantify the diagnosis of bore scoring if that comes to pass. Okay, so here I am underneath the car and we're going to do the next step in the diagnostic process which is going to be trying to differentiate audibly which cylinders are more probable to have the scoring because those are the ones that we're going to look at first. And if we find scoring in those, it pretty much downs the entire engine, which saves a lot of time. So don't just start off doing cylinder one because it's cylinder one. We're going to listen to all the cylinders and we're going to see which ones are the loudest. Now I'm using a Steelman electric or electronic ear. Okay, it's not expensive, but you don't have to have one even this nice. So this amplifies the sound. One reason we have this is because we'll be able to amplify it for you to be able to hear it on video better. Now, a cheap $20 mechanical stethoscope will do this job. It doesn't have to be an electronic one. So anything is going to work for this purpose. So I'm going to start out, I'm going to, I'm going to do cylinder one first, and then I'll do cylinder two, cylinder three, cylinder four, cylinder five, cylinder six. Now, this is bank one of the engine. Over my right shoulder is bank one of the engine in a 996, okay? Same as a 997, any rear engine car. Over my left shoulder to my left is cylinder number is cylinder bank number two, 
which are cylinders four, five, and six, okay? Now keep in mind, if you have a sooty tailpipe on the driver's side, your exhaust will cross inside the rear bumper area. So that means the sooty bumper or the sooty, sooty tailpipe is actually the exhaust outlet for the passenger side bank of cylinders, or bank number two. And now I'm gonna move forward with the stethoscope inspection. We'll start with cylinder one and end up on cylinder six. Okay, so now we're gonna begin on cylinder one. What I wanna do is come about one half of an inch on the cylinder uh, block here, I should be on the cylinder head, and we're coming about one half inch backward right here, and we're gonna target this. And what you're listening for is a tapping sound. You'll have a lot of other noises you'll hear, a lot of radial noises, but it, what you're looking for is a rhythmic tapping sound. So cylinder one, sounds good. Now, I go on back to cylinder number two, and I go to the same area. Now, it's a little tougher on two because you gotta go kind of in between the exhaust, and this is hot, okay? Okay, so I've got a lot more of a rhythmic tone on cylinder number two. A lot more tapping, a lot more rhythmic tone than I had on cylinder one. Now I'm gonna move to cylinder number three. And I'm just kind of remembering what the others sounded like. I gotta sneak in here. Cylinder three really has no ticking sound at all. Cylinder three and cylinder one were the two best on this bank. So now I'm gonna move over to cylinder four and go to bank two. Okay, cylinder number four. Now again, we're on bank number two. And it's just this little circle area you see right here, about a half inch from where the curve is. All right, cylinder number four sounds, sounds pretty good. No big problem on cylinder four. I hear a little bit of tapping noise, um, a little bit more than I heard on cylinder number two on the other side. Now I'm gonna sneak up in between here. Again, this is really hot, so you gotta be really careful. And Cylinder number five is extremely loud. Cylinder five is definitely louder than any other cylinder has been at this point. And that's what you're doing. You want to compare this noise to the other cylinders. Okay, so now we're going to go to cylinder number six. And I put a target on here just so you can kind of see where to go. All the cylinders are the same, but I marked this one. And now cylinder six is by far the loudest cylinder. So cylinders five and cylinder six are definitely the loudest two cylinders on this engine. Now, when I hear a really loud cylinder, a lot of times I want to listen to the crankcase there as well. So I sneak in right behind the exhaust here and go just above the oil filter housing, and I listen there. And this is directly under that cylinder, and it's extremely loud. And that is the sound that is often confused with a lifter. And cylinder five has that, but it's not as loud. And cylinder four does not have that. So as you can tell, this electronic ear, or a stethoscope, is a great tool in the battle against bore scoring. It helps us understand a lot more clearly where the noises come from. Now, what you noticed, if you pay attention to the video, is that cylinders one, three, and four do not have a notable type of rhythmic tick to them. Cylinder one's got a little bit. Cylinders three and four sound very clear. Cylinder four actually sounds like the best cylinder on this particular engine. Now, cylinder two on bank one, cylinders five and six on bank two all had a rhythmic ticking sound. Cylinder number six was definitely the worst by far. Cylinder five was right behind it. So now what we're gonna do, we were listening underneath the cylinder head, right? That's a place that is amplified by, by design. So it actually is the most clear place you can listen to this noise because it is, the noise is basically telescoping through into the cylinder head and we're able to get a nice clear sample of that sound and it took me years to find out the best place for this. 
Some people say, why don't you put it right under the cylinder? Well, I've noticed that we get a lot more other noises mixed in there in cer certain cases, especially on bank number one. So you notice after we finished checking cylinders four, five, and six, I went inboard and I checked under those cylinders to help confirm the noise. So now we're gonna go out to the cam cover, the valve cover, if you will, where the lifters and the valves are actually located. And this is the area where if you do have a lifter noise, the noise is going to be louder and more pronounced than it was listening under the cylinder head, which is closer to the cylinder. So this helps us to make sure that we don't misdiagnose this and we don't misdiagnose a lifter as a bad cylinder. Now that's opposite from what most of the time occurs and that is the cylinder is misdiagnosed as being a lifter noise. So now we're gonna listen to the bank two cam cover and let you understand what that noise is supposed to sound like if you have what we believe is scored bores. So now that you've got to experience listening to the lifter noise or the cylinder bore scoring noise, both underneath the cylinder head at the most amplified position, then just underneath the cylinder where it's kind of the most raw condition, and then most recently out at the cam cover where if it was a lifter it would be more pronounced, you can see the difference very clearly in those different areas. And this is kind of what separates the men from the boys with listening to this. It's where you get the sample, okay? I tend to pay attention more to that noise that we first heard underneath the cylinder head because it's always been the most accurate for me. Now, you notice when we were just doing that last diagnose, diagnostic portion of this where we were listening to the cam cover, on cylinders five and six, you could still hear a brief ticking. That's because the ticking is so loud, it is telescoping up into the valve train. So you get, don't want to be fooled by that because you're going to listen to it and it's going to sound like it has a ticking noise. But pay attention closely and go back and forth from the cam cover to under the cylinder to under the cylinder head and you will notice that it's always louder under the cylinder head and under the cylinder than it is at the cam cover if you have a cylinder problem and not a lifter problem. Again, if you have a cylinder problem and not a lifter problem. Now, if that noise was way more pronounced from the valve cover, or the cam cover, as we call it, you must start thinking that maybe you are one of the 1 20th of 1% that may have a loud lifter. Very rare, I almost don't believe it anymore these days, but we will see one a couple of times a year here at flat six. So now we've got kind of the audible portion of this done. I believe that we have bore scoring on cylinders five and six. That is very probable. Cylinder number two is possible. Now we're gonna move forward with the visual inspection of this engine. Okay, so now we're going to drain the engine oil and um, I already got this broken loose here. I wanted to show you that we've got a oil sample kit from Speed Diagnostics. So you want to take advantage of draining this oil. Uh, you know, we're going into this thinking we have bore scoring. We need all the data we can get to prove that we do. So we're going to look for that high aluminum and high silicon content uh, in the used oil analysis as well as the cut viscosity of the oil and all those other things. So we'll uh, be doing a midstream sample of oil here when we start to drain it. It's important to do the midstream sample because that way you don't have debris from around the drain plug enter it. So after it drains for, you know, three, three to five seconds at least, you can kind of bring this into the equation. Collect the oil. If you do it right, you don't make a mess. And we'll have the results back from this in three to five days. Now note the color of this engine oil, it is very black. 
A lot of times, engine oil with these cars, if it's engine's very healthy, will be a nice caramel color. Um, this oil is just completely jet black. So this would make me think that we have some hydrocarbons that have gotten in the oil uh, due to cylinder bore scoring and piston rings that have been damaged during the bore scoring, letting excess fuel and debris from the combustion process into the oil. So after our engine oil is completely drained, we're going to break away these 13 perimeter bolts here that hold on the engine oil sump. Now you notice this engine has a spacer here. This has got the LN Engineering uh, deep sump, the half court deep sump added to it as an upgrade. So because of that, this particular one ends up using a four millimeter fastener to break torque on these. So most of the time you're going to have a 10 millimeter hex here or an E10 uh, to break loose on an M97 engine. But with this one, we're going to remove these 13 four millimeters and we're going to pry the sump plate down and we'll see what we find. Okay, so here we have the sump plate. Um, we've introduced some light to make it easier to, to kind of wake up the particles. You can see some over here, and then it's almost like panning for gold where you just kind of slosh a little bit because look at the center here. There's a lot of debris there. And we see debris of all different size, shapes, and colors. And I'm actually kind of pouring some of this out now here as well. So this is a, kind of a classic case. Honestly, I didn't expect to see quite this much debris, uh, considering that this engine was at the stage it is with a bore scoring. I do see some copper here. Um, that copper usually means uh, connecting rod or main bearing wear. That's the, the shiny kind of brass looking that you see there. That would not be from the cylinders, but um, I see a little bit of every type of wear debris here. Now we're going to move forward by removing the engine oil filter and inspecting that. It'll be interesting to see how much debris we find in the filter based on what was in the sump. Okay, so what we have here is the oil filter canister. This is what we just removed from the car, and uh, we pulled the oil filter out. We're going to work with that next. What you see here is very small metal particles. Uh, you notice how it's suspended in the oil. We've talked about this in many of the videos, and how the small microscopic material being suspended in the oil is a bad thing. So this particular debris, it looks like mostly aluminum. We've introduced a magnet to it, nothing stuck to that, so it, we're going to go with it being all non-ferrous. And uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring an oil absorbent mat into the equation. And this sometimes will help us to see the, the metal as we kind of pour the oil through this absorbent mat. You can see the metal there. It takes a second for it to make its way through. But after this dries, it'll leave the metal debris behind or any debris behind. We're basically just kind of filtering out the oil now into this oil absorbent mat. And all the debris will stay on the top while the oil will pass through slowly. Now we're back down inside again. The deeper we get, the bigger the metal particles will be. Notice the, how black this oil is. Like we said, it's, this is always a contributing factor the black oil is heavily fuel laden and has a lot of combustion byproducts in it from the poor sealing cylinders. And you can see a lot of copper down there. So this engine uh, has some aluminum, some copper, but there's nothing ferrous here. So we're catching this very early on. 
Now we'll cut the filter apart and see if we can find anything there while we let this oil filter itself through the absorbent mat. Okay, so we're using a hawkbill knife here, basically a carpet cutter to cut the oil filter apart. So the way you want to do this is you start on each end and just cut the entire circumference as you see here. Once that end is off, then go to the other side. You can use other types of knives to do this, but this hawkbill knife fits the curvature of the filter very well, and it really helps the process. With the other end removed, now we can remove the center cone of the filter, and then slice one of the pleats longitudinally. And now we can lay it out like an accordion, flipped over and pull it out like an accordion. Now we'll inspect the filter for debris. Okay, so as we're looking at the filter, it's not uncommon for this very small semi-microscopic debris to be basically eaten up into the media to, to the point where you really can't see it, even with some amplified LED light and things like that. Sometimes sunlight will help, uh, but we'll take it into the sunlight and inspect it after this. As we can see with this particular one, all the debris is so very small that it's basically just been consumed into the media. Um, the filter housing certainly had a whole lot of debris in it, and the sump did as well. Uh, in this particular case, I'm wondering about this filter's ability to actually filter the oil because we don't see debris here like we saw elsewhere in the oil system. So if the filter was doing its job as well as it could, the filter should have debris that's notable. Okay, so now we've come out into the natural sunlight. This helps to light up things that you can't see inside the shop. Um, and we can see, I don't know if the camera can catch it or not, we won't know until we go back and edit it, but we can see quite a bit of debris here that's very small. Um, and again, the small stuff is what you have to worry about. And I've taken my gloves off so I can feel because the gloves kill the tactile feedback and I can feel some debris here. Um, it's very small, and this obviously a, a very early stage bore scoring, if that's what we have going on here, which we'll know shortly. Uh, but I can actually feel the debris between my fingers, and we can see it in this natural sunlight. Okay, so now we're gonna move forward with the bore scope evaluation of the cylinders, the bore scope being this device, and this is feeding into the iPad. This is a $40 device with shipping from Amazon. We're gonna give you a link to it, and it's an awesome thing. The app's a little bit hard to get used to. Once you get used to the app and get it set up with a password, it works great, even with this old beater iPad here. It's like an iPad 2 that I use for this. So the resolution of this is very good. It has the capability of recording still photos and video. The video is high resolution. The resolution is actually better than my $1,000 Snap-on professional uh, bore scope. I actually like this one better. And you can buy this one to do all this work at home that we're showing you how to do now. That's the idea of this video, is to empower you with the knowledge and the tools to do this at home in your own garage. It might take you a couple of days, but it can save you probably about $800 to $1,000, okay? So now we're going to move forward by removing the coil packs and the spark plugs from the engine, and we're gonna introduce the bore scope into the spark plug holes first. Now this is the conventional way of doing this. Everybody else you talk to, every dealership, every independent, anybody that does a bore scope evaluation is going to do it this way, from the spark plug holes in. But that only tells us one half of the story. With a car like this one, we may need the full story to see the bore scoring that is apparent, okay? If that's the case, we're gonna pull the sump plate and we're gonna end up showing you my way of doing this. For instructional purposes, we're gonna show you my way whether we need to or not. But at home, if you think you've got bore scoring and you're doing this, you may only need to pull the spark plugs to conclusively prove that you have those deep longitudinal lines in the cylinder bores that is known as bore scoring. So now we're gonna complete the removal of the coil packs and the spark plugs from the engine. 
The first step in this process is removing the heat shield. There's a couple of fasteners on it. According to the year of your car, it could be 10 millimeter or E10 fasteners holding that heat shield on. And also it could be either a five millimeter Allen or an E10 holding on the coil packs as well. So we're gonna finish uh, pulling the heat shield out here. And then we're going to remove the coil pack. This is very easy work to do at home. Now I've already disconnected the connector on top of the coil pack. I do that before I uh, break it loose. And uh, that's a, a good thing to be in the habit of because it's difficult to squeeze the connector and get it loose if the coil pack is already loose. So right up here you can may be able to see the connector here. That's the connector that I've already popped loose. And it just clicks on the top of the coil pack. You'll have to squeeze it on the outboard side and then release it and pop it up. Once you've done that, then you can pull the coil pack out of the equation here. Okay, so now we're gonna use a special spark plug socket here, 16 millimeter. You'll need a four inch extension or so to get in here far enough. And then brake torque. And typically after you've got torque broken, then you can take your socket away from the ratchet here with the extension and remove it by hand. You wanna pay attention if any of the spark plugs are loose because a loose spark plug can also make a ticking sound and it'll sound just like a lifter or just like bore scoring. These spark plugs do not have a very high torque rating, so this one did feel the way that it should. I'm gonna pull the spark plug out and look at it. And um, it's actually got a good bit of oil on it. And now we're gonna grade our spark plugs. So what you see here is our number six coil pack and spark plug. I've used a paint marker and labeled this number six. You wanna keep all of these indexed per cylinder. Mark on them, cylinder six, cylinder one, whatever they came from. We're gonna grade these and compare them all next to each other because in a perfect world, they should all have the same burn qualities. They should have the same amount of fouling, if you will. They should look the same. The, they should have about the same amount of oil on the threads um, and they should have about the same amount of wear on them. So being able to grade the spark plug along with the audible evaluation we did, coupled to the bore scope evaluation we're about to do, coupled to oil analysis and the other things we're teaching you in this video series, will help you determine if you have bore scoring. Now I will tell you, this is the worst looking plug out of the engine, and this is normal. Cylinder number six is usually the worst cylinder in an engine. Cylinder number five on this engine was actually one of the loudest, but cylinder six was the loudest. Cylinder six has the worst looking spark plug with a, least, with a worst amount of oil on it as well. And we believe we're gonna find bore scoring on cylinder six. Will we find it going through the spark plug hole the old fashioned way, or we'll find it going through the engine oil sump the Jake way? We're gonna show you coming up. So when we did our audible evaluation with the electronic ear, cylinder number one was our best sounding cylinder. That was arguable between cylinder one and three. That cylinder sounded great. This spark plug looks great. That's textbook. Cylinder number two looks pretty good as well. That cylinder was a little bit noisy, but now I think we were getting a little bit of kind of cross pollination from the noise on the other bank uh, that was kind of getting picked up on cylinder number two. This spark plug looks great. It's got a nice, good, clear porcelain. Um, it's not worn, doesn't have any debris on it. The threads are not oily, nothing like that. It's not textbook, but it looks good. Cylinder number three looks good also. Looks just as good as cylinder number one. You can see again, porcelain's clear, uh, no oil on the threads, no buildup of anything on the electrode areas, nothing like that. That one looks good also. Cylinder number four, you notice it looks a little bit blacker than the others, okay? So sooty tailpipes, all that sort of thing. This spark plug is a little bit more sooty than what we saw on cylinders one and cylinders three. Um, it still looks pretty good though, not bad. It does not show any signs of consuming oil, 
It does not show signs of detonation, nothing like that. And note, there, are, there is no oil in the threads, okay? Cylinder 5, a little bit darker in certain areas, a little bit lighter in others. Doesn't look bad based on the bore scope, or really the, the audible evaluation, if you will. I thought this cylinder might look a little bit worse than it does. Um, but no, no oil on the threads, everything looks good. Um, doesn't look totally normal, but pretty darn close. Now, cylinder number six. Houston, we have a problem. The first thing I notice is oil on the threads. That's the very first thing I notice. The second thing I notice is a huge buildup of soot. On the electrodes, the porcelain is not clear. It's basically black. This plug has, has been heavily fouled. Uh, the engine was running pretty erratically when I pulled it into the shop, and I believe this is the cylinder that was responsible for it. Right off, the biggest red, red flag that I see is oil on these threads. Now, to give you an idea, I'm going to show you cylinder six there versus cylinder one. So we've got our worst cylinder versus our best, okay? Look at the difference between these two. Every one of the plugs should look like this one. This, the one in my left hand, is rapidly showing me that we have a problem uh, isolated to cylinder number six and with cylinder bore scoring being a good probability. So I want you to notice that we have some ash uh, colored deposits on here. Sometimes that's actually pieces of the cylinder wall, the, the localized silicon have become embedded on top of the spark plug and basically kind of burned onto those electrodes uh, because of the scoring. The scoring creates the debris, then the debris is very small and it burns onto the plug. So based on this, I think we're gonna find a significant issue with cylinder number six. Okay, so there's our oily spark plug threads. Now we're going into the chamber. That is the top of where the piston rings stop. And this is the actual cylinder. Now I see some streaking there. And lo and behold, I see some massive bore scoring here. So now we have confirmed bore scoring on cylinder number six, just like we already figured we did based on our diagnosis. So in this case, and in most cases where diagnosis is carried out correctly, the bore scope is nothing more than a visual confirmation of a correct diagnosis. This was already diagnosed with the procedures that we've done previously in this video. So this is a significant case of bore scoring. It's exactly what I expected it would be. It's pretty much around the majority of the circumference of the cylinder, at least at the bottom here. And um, it's conclusive. More scoring. Okay, so I couldn't get a good view um, with the piston, actually the scope at the very bottom. So what you see at 9 o'clock here is actually 6 o'clock. That's the bottom of the piston. That's a pool of oil and fuel mixed together there where all the scoring has occurred. Uh, so I just wanted to show you that. And you notice that this piston is fairly clean because the oil in the combustion has been kind of blasting the carbon off the top of it, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to rotate this cylinder around so we're no longer at bottom dead center. So this test was done with a number six cylinder at the bottom of the bore. Now we're going to pretend that we haven't seen this bore scoring and we're going to go from the inside out, and we're going to look at this cylinder from the bottom side. We're going to put the piston at top dead center by moving the crankshaft position, and then we're going to look at this cylinder from the inside out. And that is a very non-conventional way of doing this, but sometimes it is the only way you can confirm this. We got lucky with this one because we're able to see it from the spark plug. In over half the cases, that will not hold true and you must go from the oil sump out into the bore. There we go. Okay. Okay, so here we are. We've snuck in 
through the oil sump, having to dodge oil that's, that's uh, being dumped and everything else. And now we can see the scoring on the back side of cylinder number six. We, now again, this is not through the spark plug. This is on the back side of cylinder number six is where we're at right here. It is very difficult to get in here. You have to have a very small bore scope like this one with a 90 degree mirror on it to be able to do this. But now we are seeing confirmed scoring there as well. Okay, so here we are in the back side of cylinder six. It's taken me almost 10 minutes to get inside this cylinder. When you do this, you're going to see this is very, very difficult to do. Uh, you cannot go straight into this. You've got to go from cylinder number five over and then work your way over between the two cylinders. And once you're inside the cylinder six, then you can rotate the camera around to see the scoring. Now, this is the back side. This is what your in local independent shop, this is what your Porsche dealer does not know. They do not know what they do not know, but they don't know this because Bore scoring starts on this side of the cylinder. I'll repeat, it starts on this side of the cylinder. As you can tell, this looks a lot worse than when we did the video from the opposite side. So there are a lot of times where somebody will bore scope one of these pistons and cylinders. They do not find any bore scoring. They think it's okay. They do a lifter job. It still makes noise because they bore scoped it from the wrong side. They were only seeing one half of the equation, one half of the picture. So this is tremendous bore scoring that was evident from both sides. And this is well beyond stage three and it's into stage four for this particular cylinder. After collecting the used oil sample, it was sent to the lab at Speed Diagnostics. Five days later, we received these results. Note the low viscosity, high fuel dilution, and the wear metals of aluminum that are extremely high and marked with caution. These are things that we typically see with used oil analysis from engines exhibiting cylinder bore scoring. So as you noticed in the video here, it was a lot more severe with the cylinder scoring at the base of the cylinder when we went in from the sump plate area and went in the back of the cylinder than it was when we came in the conventional way from the spark plug hole and looked down the bore. We still saw there was bore scoring, we still saw that it was severe, but we did not see the whole entire picture as far as severity goes till we went in the non-conventional way, the flat six innovations way from the inside out. So. That $40 bore scope from Amazon proved to be worth its weight in gold. Um, you know, about another $40 worth of hand tools, and you can do this job yourself at home. Um, you know, that's why we've done this video. I wanted to help empower the enthusiast to be able to do this without spending $800 to $1,000. Shops are actually charging that, and honestly, they have to. When you look at the kind of time that it takes to do this, which is basically all day long, you've got to charge accordingly for that. So if you pay $800 to $1,000, you're getting your money's worth as long as the job is being done with a great deal of detail, okay? So it's not they're charging too much, they've got to charge for their time, but you can spend less than $80 on hand tools and a bore scope, and you can do this job yourself in your own garage. So thank you for viewing this video. I'm Jake Raby, Flat Six Innovations. We're going to come back with a final video in this series to talk about living with bore scoring. And if you don't want to live with it, how we reconstruct the engine to make sure it never happens again.